Welcome to chapter 21, lecture 2. In this lecture, we will learn about the biosynthesis and regulation of eicosanoids, triacylglycerols, and phospholipids. Eicosanoids are a family of very potent biological signaling molecules that act as short-range messengers affecting tissues near the cells that produce them. Eicosanoids include prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and thromboxanes. These molecules are created from arachidinate that is incorporated in the phospholipids of membranes. In response to hormonal or other stimuli, phospholipase A2, present in most type of mammalian cells, attacks membrane phospholipids, releasing arachidinate. Enzymes of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum then convert arachidinate to prostaglandins, PGG2 and PGH2. PGH2 is the immediate precursor of many other prostaglandins and thromboxanes. The two reactions that lead to PGH2 are catalyzed by a bifunctional enzyme called PGH2 synthase or cyclooxygenase. In the first step, cyclooxygenase introduces a molecular oxygen to convert arachidinate to PGG2. This results in a peroxidase, uh, peroxide kind of a compound. In the next step, PGG2 is converted to PGH2 by the peroxidase activity of COX in this uh, reaction, this hydroperoxide uh, molecule is converted to an alcohol. Now, prostaglandins with different functional groups on the ring are given different letter designations. For example, a functional group OOH on the ring is given PGG and OH is given PGH. The subscript, however, uh, that is shown here, the number indicates the number of double bonds. For example, a subscript of two indicates two double bonds in PGG2 and PGH2. Prostaglandins with two double bonds, all of which are derived from arachidinate, are referred to as series two prostaglandins. Those with Three double bonds are series three prostaglandins. Mammalian cyclooxygenase has two isozymes, namely cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, or COX2. These two isozymes have different functions, but closely similar amino acid sequences. In addition, these two enzymes also have similar reaction mechanisms at both of their catalytic centers. COX-1 catalyzes synthesis of prostaglandins that regulate gastric mucin secretion. On the other hand, COX-2 catalyzes the synthesis of prostaglandins that mediate pain, inflammation, and fever. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin and ibuprofen inhibit COX-2. Pain can be relieved by inhibiting cyclooxygenase activity, specifically COX-2 activity. The first drug widely marketed for this purpose was aspirin or acetylsalicylate. Aspirin is an irreversible inhibitor of the cyclooxygenase enzyme. In this case, aspirin acetylates a serine residue in the active site. This results in an inactivated COX because the serine residue is acetylated. Um, as a result, it blocks the active site in COX enzymes, thereby preventing the synthesis of prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Ibuprofen and naproxen are also non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
These two are competitive inhibitors of cyclooxygenase. In this case, they resemble the substrate and as a result, they block the active site in both isozymes. Leukotrienes, like prostaglandins, are also synthesized from arachidinate. Leukotrienes are linear molecules, unlike prostaglandins, that have a ring in them. Leukotriene synthesis begins with the action of several lipoxygenases that incorporate an oxygen onto arachidinate to form a peroxide kind of a molecule. Now, depending on what kind of lipoxygenase acts on arachidinate, the position of peroxides varies. The linear pathway from arachidinate, unlike the cyclic pathway, is not inhibited by aspirin or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. In the next section, we will learn about the biosynthesis and regulation of triacylglycerols. Animals can synthesize and store large quantities of triacylglycerols only to be used later as fuel. Plants also manufacture triacylglycerols as an energy-rich fuel that is mainly stored in fruits, seeds, and nuts. The total amount of stored triacylglycerol in a 70 kilogram human being is about 15 kilograms. So a 70 kilogram human being has about 15 kilograms of fat. Now this is enough to last for 12 weeks. On the other hand, humans can only store a few hundred grams of glycogen in liver and muscle that is barely enough to supply the energy needs for 12 hours. This means that triacylglycerols have the highest energy content of all stored nutrients. Animals, plants, and bacteria make phospholipids for cell membranes. In animal tissues, the biosynthesis of triacylglycerols and glycerophospholipids share two precursors, L-glycerol-3-phosphate and fatty acyl-CoA. The vast majority of glycerol-3-phosphate is derived from the glycolytic intermediate dihydroxyacetone phosphate by the action of the enzyme glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Some glycerol 3 phosphate uh, is made from glycerol as well, and this is uh, done by the action of glycerol kinase, which converts glycerol to glycerol 3 phosphate. This happens as a minor pathway in liver and kidney. The next precursor. Uh, of triacylglycerols are fatty acyl coas fatty acyl coa is formed from fatty acids by the action of acyl coa synthetases the same enzymes responsible for the activation of fatty acids for beta oxidation the first stage in the biosynthesis of triacylglycerols is acylation of the two free hydroxyl groups of L-glycerol 3 phosphate by two molecules of fatty acyl CoA to yield phosphatidic acid. Fatty acyl CoAs are derived from fatty acids by the action of acyl CoA synthetases. Phosphatidic acid is only present in trace amounts in cells but is a central intermediate in lipid biosynthesis. The advantages of making phosphatidic acid is that it can then be converted to triacylglycerol or a phospholipid. Phosphatidic acid can be modified to form triacylglycerol or glycerophospholipid. The action of phosphatidic acid phosphatase or lipin converts phosphatidic acid to 1,2-diacylglycerol. In this reaction, 
a phosphate group is removed from phosphatidic acid. Acyl transferase transfers an acyl group to the free hydroxy group of 1,2-diacylglycerol to form a triacylglycerol molecule. Phosphatidic acid can also be converted to glycerol phospholipid by the attachment of head groups such as serine, choline, or ethanolamine. We'll talk about this reaction in the next section when we discuss membrane phospholipids. The rate of triacylglycerol biosynthesis is profoundly altered by the action of various hormones such as insulin. Insulin stimulates the conversion of dietary carbohydrates and proteins to triacylglycerols through this pathway. As shown in this figure, insulin activates this pathway that is coming from either glucose or amino acids to the formation of acetyl-CoA. In addition, conversion of acetyl-CoA to fatty acids is also upregulated. People with diabetes mellitus either lack insulin or are insensitive towards it. As a result, these, this pathway is not upregulated. The result is that the fatty acid biosynthesis is decreased and the excess acetyl-CoA that is produced is shunted instead to making ketone bodies. An additional factor in the balance between biosynthesis and degradation of triacylglycerols is that approximately 75% free fatty acids released by lipolysis are re-esterified to form triacylglycerols rather than be used for fuel. A fascinating point is that this ratio, that is 75%, persists even under starvation conditions when energy metabolism is shunted from the use of carbohydrates to the oxidation of fatty acids. Some of this recycling takes place in the adipose tissue as well. In mammals, triacylglycerol molecules are broken down and resynthesized in a triacylglycerol cycle during starvation. Some of the fatty acids released by lipolysis of triacylglycerols uh, exit the adipose tissue into the bloodstream and the remainder of the fatty acids are used for resynthesis of triacylglycerols. These fatty acids that are released into the blood are used for energy, for example, in muscle cells, and some are taken up by the liver and used in triacylglycerol synthesis. The triacylglycerol formed in the liver is transported in the blood back to the adipose tissue where the fatty acid is released by the extracellular lipoprotein lipase. The fatty acids enter the adipocytes and re gets re-esterified to triacylglycerols. Although the distribution between these two paths may vary, the overall percentage of free fatty acids being esterified remains at 75%. The level of free fatty acids in the blood thus reflects both the rate of release of fatty acids and the balance between the synthesis and breakdown of triacylglycerols in the adipose tissue and in liver. The constant recycling of triacylglycerols in the adipose tissue even during starvation raises another question. What is the source of glycerol 3-phosphate needed for fatty acid reesterification. During lipolysis, which is stimulated by glucagon or epinephrine, the process glycolysis is usually inhibited. So, dihydroxyacetone phosphate is not readily available to make glycerol 3 phosphate. In addition, adipose cells don't have glycerol kinase to make glycerol 3 phosphate on site. So, if you recollect, glycerol 3 phosphate is usually made from two pathways 
one from dihydroxyacetone phosphate, another from glycerol using glycerol kinase. Now, when these two pathways are shut down, it is not clear as to how glycerol 3 phosphate is obtained. The answer lies in a pathway named glyceroneogenesis. This is very similar to the glyconeogenesis pathway. Adipose cells make dihydroxyacetone phosphate via glyceroneogenesis. Glyceroneogenesis is a shortened version of glyconeogenesis, wherein pyruvate is converted to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Furthermore, this dihydroxyacetone phosphate is then converted to glycerol 3 phosphate by glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase and glycerol 3 phosphate is further converted to triacetylglycerols. Glycerol neogenesis is basically an abbreviated version of gluconeogenesis in the liver and adipose tissues. The discovery of glycerol neogenesis in adipose tissue is important because of the identification of two enzymes, pyruvate carboxylase and phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. This is because in adipose tissues, glucose is not synthesized, and hence glycerol neogenesis is an important pathway for the production of glycerol 3 phosphate. Glycerol neogenesis has multiple roles. In adipose tissues, glycerol neogenesis coupled with re-esterification of free fatty acids control the rate of fatty acid release to the blood. However, in the liver, glycerol neogenesis supports the synthesis of enough glycerol 3 phosphate to account for about 65 percent of fatty acids re-esterified to triacylglycerol. Flux through the triacylglycerol cycle between liver and adipose tissue is controlled to a large degree by the activity of phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. This enzyme limits the rate of both gluconeogenesis and glyceroneogenesis. Glucocorticoid hormones such as cortisol and dexamethasone regulate the levels of phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase reciprocally in the liver and adipose tissues. Acting through the glucocorticoid receptors, these two steroid hormones increase the expression of the gene encoding phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase in the liver, thus increasing gluconeogenesis and glyceroneogenesis in the liver. Stimulation of glyceroneogenesis leads to an increase in the synthesis of triacylglycerols in the liver and they release into the blood. At the same time, glucocorticoids, uh, cortisol and dexamethasone, suppress the expression of the gene that expresses phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase in the adipose tissue. This results in a decrease in the glycerol neogenesis pathway in adipose tissue. As a result, the formation of triacylglycerols is decreased. And as a result, free fatty acids are not recycled and are released into the bloodstream. Thus, regulation of glyceroneogenesis in the liver and in the adipose tissue affects lipid metabolism in opposite ways. A lower rate of glyceroneogenesis in the adipose tissue leads to more fatty acid release, whereas a higher rate in the liver leads to more synthesis of triacylglycerols. The net result is an increase in the flux through the triacylglycerol cycle. When the glucocorticoid 
uh, glucocorticoids such as cortisol and dexa dexamethasone are no longer present, flux through the cycle decle declines as the expression of phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase increase in adipose tissues and decrease in the liver. As a result, more triacylglycerols are made in the adipose tissues. Let us consider another scenario regarding glyceroneogenesis in adipose tissues. High levels of free fatty acids in the blood interfere with glucose utilization in muscle and promote the insulin resistance that leads to type 2 diabetes. A class of drugs called thiazolidinones reduce the level of fatty acids circulating in the blood and also increase the sensitivity of insulin. Siglitazone is one such thiazolidinone drug. Thiazolidinones promote the induction of phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase in adipose tissues, leading to increased synthesis of precursors of glyceroneogenesis. The therapeutic effect of thiazolidinones is thus due at least in part to increase in glyceroneogenesis which in turn increases the resynthesis of triacylglycerols in adipose tissues and reduces the release of fatty acids uh, into the bloodstream. In eukaryotic cells, phospholipid synthesis occurs primarily on the surfaces of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and the inner mitochondrial membrane. The first step of glycerophospholipid synthesis are shared with the pathway to triacylglycerols. It begins with phosphatidic acid or diacylglycerols. The polar head group of glycerophospholipids is attached through a phosphodiester bond in which each of the two alcohol hydroxyls, one on the polar head group, and one on the C3 of glycerol form an ester with phosphoric acid. In the biosynthetic process, one of the hydroxyls is usually activated. We'll talk about it in the next slide. In the biosynthetic process, one of the hydroxyls is first activated by the attachment of a nucleotide, cytidine diphosphate. There are two strategies that exist in the synthesis of glycerophospholipid. In strategy 1, diacylglycerol is activated with CDP to form CDP diacylglycerol. Uh, this molecule is attacked by a hydroxyl from the head group to displace cytidine monophosphate. This results in the formation of glycerophospholipid. In strategy two, the head group is activated with cytidine diphosphate. And the hydroxyl from the third position of 1,2-diacylglycerol attacks the phosphate, thereby displacing CMP, resulting in the formation of glycerophospholipid. Eukaryotic cells employ both strategies, whereas bacteria use only strategy one. This slide shows the biosynthetic route for the synthesis of phosphatidylglycerol and phosphatidylethanolamine in E. coli. Like I said before, E. coli uses strategy one wherein it activates a diacylglycerol using CDP. The CDP diacylglycerol is then acted upon by phospho phosphatidylglycerol 3-phosphate synthase to convert CDP glycerol to phosphatidylglycerol 3-phosphate. The mechanism is shown in this red box on the right. The hydroxyl from glycerol 3 phosphate attacks the phosphate of CDP glycerol, thereby 
releasing CMP. This results in the formation of phosphatidylglycerol 3-phosphate. This molecule is further acted upon by phosphatidylglycerol 3-phosphate phosphatase. As the name suggests, it removes a phosphate group from phosphatidylglycerol 3-phosphate. This results in the formation of phosphatidylglycerol. Now, for the synthesis of phosphatidylethanol amine, uh, serine, the amino acid, attacks CDP diacylglycerol using its side chain hydroxyl. This results in the formation of phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine is uh, synthesized by phosphatidylserine synthase. Phosphatidylserine decarboxylase decarboxylates a carboxyl group on the serine uh, substituent of phosphatidylserine, resulting in the formation of phosphatidylethanolamine. The phospholipid cardiolipin is biosynthesized in E. coli and eukaryotes via two different mechanisms. In bacteria, and specifically in E. coli, cardiolipin is biosynthesized from phosphatidylglycerol and is catalyzed by cardiolipin synthase. This enzyme utilizes another phosphatidylglycerol molecule and releases glycerol in this process resulting in the formation of cardiolipin. Again, the mechanism is straightforward in the sense that the hydroxy from phosphatidylglycerol, which is this, attacks this phosphate, releasing glycerol. However, in eukaryotes, cardiolipin is biosynthesized from CDP diacylglycerol and is catalyzed by the eukaryotic cardiolipin synthase. In this process, the enzyme uses another phosphatidylglycerol molecule and releases a CMP in this process, resulting in the formation of cardiolipin. Remember, the differences in these two processes are the different enzymes, one is bacterial, one is eukaryotic, and different substrates. Uh, phosphatidylglycerol in case of E. coli and CDP diacylglycerol in case of eukaryotes. The products are also different. Glycerol is one of the products in E. coli and CMP is another in case of eukaryotes. Biosynthesis of two different phospholipids are shown in this slide. On the left is the biosynthesis of phosphatidyl inositol in mammals and on the right is the biosynthesis of phosphatidyl choline in yeast cells. Phosphatidyl inositol is synthesized by the condensation of CDP diacylglycerol with inositol. This reaction is catalyzed by phosphatidyl inositol synthase. The product is phosphatidyl inositol and a CMP. Phosphatidyl inositol is further phosphorylated by phosphatidyl inositol kinase to phosphorylated products. This enzyme, phosphatidyl inositol kinase, phosphorylates these hydroxy groups that are shown and are shaded in orange. <clears throat> phosphatidyl inositol and its phosphorylated products uh, in the plasma membrane play a central role in signal transduction in eukaryotes. On a totally different note, the biosynthesis of phosphatidyl choline in yeast happens via this route. Phosphatidylcholine is biosynthesized from phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine is decarboxylated by phosphatidylserine decarboxylase to form phosphatidylethanolamine. Phosphatidylethanolamine is then acted upon by a methyl transferase which transfers three methyl group uh, and this results in the formation of phosphatidylcholine. The methyl transferase uses s adenosyl methionine as a cofactor uh, to transfer methyl groups to the nitrogen of phosphatidylethanolamine. In mammals, phosphatidylserine is not biosynthesized from CDP diacylglycerol. Instead, 
It is made from phosphatidyl ethanol amine or phosphatidyl uh, choline. And this happens via a calcium dependent head group exchange reaction that is promoted by two different enzymes, phosphatidyl serine synthase 1 and phosphatidyl serine synthase 2, PSS1 and PSS2. PSS1 uses either phosphatidyl ethanol amine or phosphatidyl choline as substrates to convert them to phosphatidyl serine. Phosphatidyl choline is biosynthesized in mammals via strategy 2. Choline is a head group. Choline can first get phosphorylated to phosphocholine by choline kinase. Phosphocholine can then be acted upon by CTP choline cytidyl transferase, which uses cytidine triphosphate and adds it to phosphocholine to make CDP choline. CDP choline is further acted upon by CDP choline diacylglycerol phosphocholine transferase, which uses diacylglycerol as another substrate and adds it to CDP choline to form phosphatidyl choline. Um, an analogous salvage pathway also exists for ethanolamine. Instead of choline, ethanol amine can also undergo similar reactions to form phosphatidyl ethanol amine. This slide summarizes the pathways for synthesis of major phospholipids and triacylglycerols in a eukaryotic system such as yeast. Now to start with, phosphatidic acid can be synthesized from glycerol 3-phosphate via lysophosphatidate intermediate. Phosphatidate can then get converted to diacylglycerol or CDP diacylglycerol. Diacylglycerol is then acted upon by CDP ethanol amine or CDP choline to phosphatidyl ethanol amine or phosphatidyl choline. Now we saw this pathway, uh, we saw this pathway in the previous slide, right? Choline getting converted to phosphocholine and then CDP choline reacting with diacylglycerol to form phosphatidyl choline. Um, in yeast specifically, CDP diacylglycerol can be converted to phosphatidyl inositol or phosphatidyl glycerol 3 phosphate or uh, phosphatidyl serine. In mammals, phosphatidyl serine is formed from phosphatidyl ethanolamine or phosphatidyl choline. In addition, cardiolipin can also be formed from CDP diacylglycerol. Uh, which gets converted to phosphatidyl glycerol 3 phosphate and then to phosphatidyl glycerol and then finally to cardiolipin. So it is important to understand these reactions that leads to the synthesis of phospholipids. Um, for the purpose of the exam, please compare and contrast various different pathways. Uh, comparison of these pathways in a bacterium uh, yeast as well as a mammalian cell would be much more useful.